this morning. Jeez, oh, wasn't ready. Thank you all. Here we go. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. I uh, uh, hope everybody's uh, doing all right. I know if you were like me with no sunshine out this morning and just looking like a rainy day, the temptation was to just crawl back in, crawl back into bed and enjoy a, a nap a little bit longer. I'm seeing so much green. Look at us Protestants out here celebrating, celebrating uh, St. Patrick's Day. All right? But uh, anyways, I'm going to actually talk about something useful now. We do have a few announcements. We're glad everybody's here this morning, uh, but we do have a few announcements uh, coming up. Uh, first off, not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday uh, is our uh, spring churchwide picnic uh, and Easter egg hunt. So we'll have uh, instead of normal Wednesday night services next Wednesday the 27th, uh, we'll be out on the we'll be out on the back lawn. Uh, we'll cook out. We'll have a good time. Tell the kids the Easter story, and they'll uh, bulldoze each other and do all the good things they do to get some candy uh, out of those eggs. If you have not signed up in a plan to be there, please uh, do your best uh, to call the church office or sign up in Sunday school uh, so that we can have that. Uh, an accurate count by this Wednesday. Uh, it was announced in Sunday school, but you'll also see it uh, in your bulletin right here. There is a, uh, uh, a, a section titled, You Asked For It. In May, on Wednesday nights, we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, we did something similar to it a few years ago, but this is going to be a time uh, for you to put your staff on the hot seat. All right. If there's any burning questions in your mind, whether it be about the Bible, following Jesus, uh, current issues, topics, anything that you want to hear from your staff on, this will be an opportunity for you to ask us anything. And I did tell them in Sunday school, just remember the title. Uh, if you get an answer don't, you don't like, just remember, you asked for it. Um, but uh, in Sunday school, uh, in the vegetables, there are index cards available for you. And if you would like to write down a question, these can be anonymous. So maybe there's a question you want to ask, but you don't want to raise your hand and say it in front of everybody. Uh, but these, these are going to be anonymous. And if you want to hear what we think uh, on any of these topics, uh, just write it down. Put it. I, I, uh, <laughs> sorry, I saw some people plotting back there. I saw some people plotting about what they're going to put in already. But uh, if you want to put it uh, on an index card, uh, put it down and do that by Wednesday, April the 3rd, and we'll be happy to have a month to marinate on it uh, and give our best answers. And I'm sure that we won't have to leave any on the cutting room floor. Uh, but we do want to hear what you're thinking about, and we would love to be able to walk with you and work through you through any serious questions or issues you might have about the Bible uh, or following Jesus uh, in today's time. I do want to continue to spotlight our Annie Armstrong Easter offering. We've got a few more weeks till Easter, but we are taking up uh, money for the North American Mission Board to fund church planting and church revitalization efforts here in North America. That's a great opportunity and a great way for us to plug in uh, as Southern Baptists across the country and to support some meaningful ministry going Going on in our country uh, and surrounding area. Uh, before we get started this morning, I wanted to read from Psalm chapter 8 uh, to you. It starts off with, Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. You have covered the heavens with your majesty, and from the mouths of infants and nursing babes, you have established a stronghold on account of your adversaries in order to silence the enemy and the avenger. Verse 3 says, when I observe your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, and the stars which you set in place, what is a human being that you remember him and a son of man that you look after him? We worship God for many reasons. First of all, because of God, who he, who he is. He is, my, he is almighty. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. He's all-knowing. He is eternal. He is immutable. There is no one like God. We worship God for what he's done for us. He sent Jesus uh, to this earth to forgive us of our sins. He walks with us. But I think one of the most joyful reasons and things we can remember when we come in here and worship God together is that no matter how big he is, he is infinite, eternal, endless, and we are a speck in the grand scheme of things. The Bible says that we are but a vapor. No matter how small we are or insignificant we think we are, God watches us and he is mindful of us, and he keeps his eyes, his mind, his attention, and his love on people like us. Let's worship that God together this morning. Let's stand and worship in song. the house. 
of promises that we claim. Father, thank you for the promises that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. Father, you're always with us. Thank you for the promise of where two or three are gathered together. Father, you are there in their midst, and we claim that this morning, that you are here with us as we worship you. Just help us, Father, to see your presence here among us. For it's in your holy name we do pray. Amen.
Good morning. This is the time in our service where we have the opportunity to um, lift those up that are listed on our corner of concern. If you'll take out your uh, white sheet there in your bulletin. Um, we do not have any additions or changes this morning, but if you'll take this with you throughout the week, pick out a few names and um, just lift them up to the Lord during your prayer time throughout the week. Um, but let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer now. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful to be in your house this morning, Lord, and just to worship you. Lord, we have so many names listed here at home, um, those that have lost loved ones, friends and loved ones who, um, who are sick and, and dealing with different situations. Lord, you know each one, even those that aren't listed here, Lord. You know each situation, each circumstance. Lord, uh, just ask that you would be with each one of those that are listed here or not listed, Lord, that your presence be felt, Lord, that um, you would just work in each situation, Lord, as you see fit. Lord, we also pray for our military that are fighting for our freedom, Lord. We just pray that you would uh, protect them, Lord, and just bring them home safe. Lord, those on missions who deal with different situations each day, Lord, I just pray that you would keep them safe, Lord, and just give them the, um, the words to speak to uh, just grow your ministry. Lord, we also want to lift up our church, Lord. We just pray for the direction that you already have planned out for us, Lord, and we pray that we would seek you and seek that direction. Lord, uh, we just pray that uh, we would grow closer together as a church, Lord, throughout this process, that your Holy Spirit would just move, move among us, Lord, and that um, we would just be more united throughout this process. Lord, as we move further into the service, I just pray that you would um, be with Brother Keith as he brings the message. Lord, and that our hearts would be open to the message that you have laid out before us to hear this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Children, if you'll come on down now, it's time for the children's sermon. Well, hi, boys and girls. I see a lot of y'all are wearing green today. I'm wearing green. Why are we wearing green today? Because it's St. Patrick's Day. It's St. Patrick's Day. So happy St. Patrick's Day. So St. Patrick's Day is really a holiday that um, is, we think about being celebrated mostly in Ireland, but we like to talk about it in the United States too. It's kind of fun to wear green and talk about things like, do y'all know what this is? A leprechaun. A leprechaun is kind of like a make-believe fairy, and so the reason we wear green on leprechaun on um, St. Patrick's Day is because they say if you wear green, it'll make you invisible to the leprechaun, and he won't be able to play naughty little tricks on you, like giving you a pinch. So that's why we pinch our friends if they're not wearing green. But we're not going to pinch anybody in church today, okay? <laughs> so, all right. So another, you want to have a seat right here? You can sit right here. Want to sit down? All right, there you go. All right. So another fun thing, myth, that means it's not really true, but it's kind of fun to think about, that if you catch a leprechaun, he'll give you three wishes if you'll let him go. So if you could catch a leprechaun, what's something you would wish for? Peyton? A new dog? A monkey. Ooh, that'd be cool. <laughs> a kitty. I know you like kitties. What about you? Oh, you'd like to turn into an animal. What about you? Like a, billion dollars. a billion dollars. That would be nice. <laughs> what about you, David? A Lamborghini. All right. Well, you know, one fun thing about um, leprechauns is they say that 
they have a pot of gold hidden at the end of the rainbow. So if you could find that pot of gold, you could buy all that stuff we talked about and even more, couldn't you? Well, you know, we know leprechauns aren't real, but it's kind of fun to talk about them. But did you know there was a real man named St. Patrick who lived in Ireland a long, long, long time ago, way before we were even born? And when he was just a young man or a young boy, he got kidnapped from his family. And um, he, was, he escaped one day, and he went to another country. And when he went to that country, he actually learned about Jesus and accepted him as his Savior. And so he felt God calling him to go back to Ireland and teach all the people the good news of Jesus. And that's what he did, and that's why we remember St. Patrick. And you know what? He didn't believe in leprechauns, and he didn't chase riches at the end of the rainbow. He chased, he was after the kind of riches that Jesus talks, uh, talks to us about in heaven. In Matthew, Jesus talks about how he wants us to be concerned about heavenly things, not earthly riches. Jesus wants us to live with him in heaven forever. And did you know that we can do that by accepting Jesus as our Savior? You might have heard this verse before. And if you know how to read, you can read it with me. Or you might um, be familiar with it and say it. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. Who's God's only Son? Jesus. That's right. That whoever believes in him will not die, but will have eternal life. And eternal life, where will you spend your eternal life? Heaven. In heaven, that's exactly right. So that's the kind of... Um, Riches that we want to be concerned about is, uh, is things, of, things that are in heaven. You know, there's no pot of gold in heaven, but there are streets of gold. Did you know that? The Bible tells us about streets of gold in Revelations. So if you want to go to heaven and live with Jesus and see those streets of gold, all you have to do is accept Jesus as your Savior. And if you want to know more about that, you can ask your parents. You can ask your Sunday school teacher. You can ask your parents to let you talk to one of our preachers and find out how you can accept Jesus as your Savior and have riches forever in heaven. All right, so let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for these boys and girls. Thank you for sending your um, son so that we could accept him as our Savior and live with you forever in heaven. Amen. Now, I've got something for you. I've got you... A piece of gold and some real, because this isn't really worth anything, is it? But I got you some real treasure, a piece of candy. All right, if you're not going to Children's Church, sit right there and I'll give it to you. But if you are, you can go with, are you going to Children's Church? Okay. Okay.
today's scripture is Hebrews 4, 1 through 11. And my caption says, Sabbath rest for the people of God. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard did not combine it with faith. Now we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said. So I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his work has been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day of these, in these words. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his work. And again in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. It still remains that some will enter that rest, and those who formerly had the gospel preached to them did not go in because, the, because of their disobedience. Therefore, God again set a certain day, calling it today, when a long time later he spoke through David. As it was said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would have not spoken. Later about another day, there remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from his own work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. We rest in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Let's stand and sing together, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Him.
are a God who is faithful to your promises, and we can trust you completely. We are especially grateful for Christ's work on the cross and that we can rest in that finished work, that it is not up to our efforts. Show us now, God, in your word how we can trust you more fully and depend on you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Concerning the, um, you ask for it, that is the last session of our midweek together. So that's what we're calling it, you ask for it. And we have four Wednesday nights during the month of May that we will tackle these questions. And you realize that some questions cannot be answered on this side of eternity. And for those questions like that, we will say, we don't know, because some things are yet to be revealed to us. There are uh, questions that may be asked that uh, may be more difficult than others. And if we have an overwhelming number of questions, then we won't be able to get to all of those questions. And so some of those difficult questions, the staff can answer after I retire in, um, in the fall. We won't do that to you. We'll do our very best to give you an answer as the way we feel that God is leading us to answer through his word. Everything will be based on his word, not ours. Speaking of his word, this morning we're looking in Numbers chapter 13 and 14. So take your Bible and turn there. We're looking at people in the Old Testament who put faith into action. And as we do that, that, we're drawing out some points of practical faith that we can apply to our own lives. And this will be the last of these long Old Testament passages that we've done. Uh, last night I was going over this and uh, I had made a PDF of my Bible and it was on my iPad and I was going over it last night, and Liam saw me doing that. And he said, um, how many pages do you read for your sermon? And I said, well, these is one or two pages. He said, it seems like 10. <laughs> that was right after he asked, how long do you preach? And I said, around 25 minutes. He said, it seems like an hour. <laughs> so... Y'all make and identify with um, Liam. It seemed like an hour. These are long passages, but they are all connected. Uh, as we're looking at this, we've looked at the applied faith of Samuel and Jehoshaphat and Hezekiah. This morning, we're going to look at Caleb, also Joshua, because he's mentioned with Caleb, but primarily Caleb, and it's because they acted in faith when the majority did not. They stood alone. And so we're looking for faith in action, that is, belief that affects our attitudes and actions in daily life. That's what belief does. That's what it means to stand on the promises of God, that you stand on them in a way that it affects your daily living. Well, in the context of this story, this passage, is it's from the period of the patriarchs, occurring somewhere around 1400 B.C. So if you think back uh, about Genesis, Genesis tells us about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and how Israel, God's covenant people, came to be uh, bonded, in bondage in Egypt for 430 years. So we read about that in Genesis. And then Exodus tells us about how God raised up Moses to deliver his people from that bondage in Egypt. And then Exodus goes on to tell us how the, the law was given. And that law was given in order to set God's people apart from all other nations. And then we have Leviticus, which explains that law in detail. And then Numbers. And Numbers tells us about how the Israelites were organized in the wilderness 
and how they were prepared to enter the promised land that God had promised Abraham over 600 years earlier and eventually how they did enter the land. Well, this passage today takes place two years after Moses led the people out of Egypt. So two years they had been moving just south of Canaan. And there they were, and God spoke to Moses to prepare them to enter. So two years since they had left, they are being prepared to enter and take possession of the land that God promised Abraham. And so let's look. This is Numbers 13. The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. Now that's significant right there. We'll come back to that. Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. So there were 12 tribes of Israel. So from each tribe, Moses was to send one representative, one leader, to explore the land that God was giving the Israelites. And so there's the list there, uh, verses 4 and following. And among those listed, we have Caleb and Hosea, or Joshua. And so Moses sent them out with a charge, go explore this land. And uh, he wanted to know about the land, he wanted to know about the people, he wanted to know about the towns, the soil, he wanted to know about the fruit, because they were going to take possession of it. And so they went and they explored the land for 40 days. And then at the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. Then verse 26, they came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. They confirmed that this was a good land that was being given to them. Verse 28, but, but, but the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. What were they basing their uh, attitude on? Their own strength. They are stronger than we are. That might have been true, but they're relying on their strength instead of God's strength. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there were of great size. Notice, earlier they had just mentioned they saw people of great size. Now they're saying all the people who live there are of great size. That's because fear multiplies. Have you ever noticed that? Fear in your own life multiplies and it makes things seem worse than they really are, if you let it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak, come from the Nephilim. Probably Goliath was from this line. 
We seem like grasshoppers in our eyes, and we look the same to them. Chapter 14. That night, all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. Hopelessness and despair is contagious. So all the people, they were weeping aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this desert. Remember that phrase. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. They preferred bondage to the freedom and to what God was giving them because in bondage they were comfortable. It was familiar. And aren't we the same way? We like things that are familiar to us, even if it means we are in bondage. They wanted to go back. Let's get us a leader to take us back. Leaders don't lead backwards, forward. You know, this church is facing uh, a change of leadership. And there may be some of you in this fellowship that want to go back to the glory days of First Baptist Church, of the 60s or 70s or whenever those glory days were for you. You may want to go back to that. No, you don't do that. We don't live back there. We live right here. And we're facing forward. And that's the direction that we are going. We're going forward. We don't go back. Verse 5. Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. How does one please God? By faith. The Bible says without faith no one can please God. So it is in faith that people please God. And that's what Caleb and Joshua are pleading with these people to do. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will swallow them up. How did they know that? Because God had told them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. But the whole assembly talked about stoning them. Then the glory of of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. The Lord said to Moses, How long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the miraculous signs I have performed among them? How long, God says to Moses, how long am I going to put up with these people? And I read that and I think, does, the, does God say the same thing about me? He certainly can. How long, God, will you put up with me? And see, as you grow in your faith, it's not that you get to the place that you are so good that you find favor with God that way, but it's that you see and you realize how dependent you are on what Jesus has done for you. That's the sign of spiritual growth. And you realize, yes, God, how long will you put up with me? Just like he was saying of the Israelites. 
How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the miraculous signs I have performed among them? Think about all that they had seen in coming out of Egypt. But think also about Jesus. All of the miracles that he performed and yet those Pharisees, those religious leaders, and the people did not believe. Verse 12, I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them. But I will make you into a nation greater and stronger than they. Moses said to the Lord, Then the Egyptians will he hear about it. By your power you brought these people up from among them, and they will tell the inhabitants of this land about it. They have already heard that you, O Lord, are with these people and that you, O Lord, have, seen, have been seen face to face, that your cloud stays over them and that you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. If you put these people to death all at one time, the nations will have heard this report about you and they will say, the Lord was not able to bring these people into the land. He promised them on oath. And he slaughtered them in the desert. So Moses is interceding with God on behalf of the people. Now may the Lord's strength be displayed as you have declared. The Lord is slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. That just simply means that sin has consequences that affect those behind you. It affects your family. It affects people around you because sin leaves consequences in its wake. Verse 19, in accordance with your great love, forgive these people just as you have pardoned them from the time they left Egypt until now. So Moses is, is praying to God, forgive these people. Does that sound familiar? Jesus praying for the people, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. The Lord replied, I have forgiven them as you asked. Nevertheless, nevertheless, See, they had forgiveness, but the consequences of sin remain. And that's because forgiveness removes the condemnation of sin, but not necessarily the consequences. Nevertheless, as surely as I live, and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of the men who saw my glory and the miraculous signs I performed in Egypt and in the desert, but who dis disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their forefathers. Now sometimes Canaan is used as a, a metaphor looking forward to, to heaven, but not always, and I don't think it does here. Moses did not enter Canaan, yet Moses had faith in God and certainly did enter heaven. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. Then verse 24, but because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his, de his descendants will inherit it. Since the uh, Amalekites and Canaanites are living in the valley, Turn back tomorrow and set out toward the desert along the route to the Red Sea. So they were turned back to spend the next uh, 38 years wandering in the desert because of their disbelief. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, How long will this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do the very thing I heard you say. 
in this desert, your bodies will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who, has, who was counted in the census and who has grumbled against me, not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. Remember back in verse 2, they said, if only we had died in Egypt or in this desert. God heard that, and that's where they died. Be careful what you say to God, because he hears. He hears. And just as they said, is what they got. As far as your children that you said would be taken as plunder, I will bring them in to enjoy the land you have rejected. But you, your bodies will fall in this desert. Your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness. See, that's the, the consequences. If we are unfaithful and we teach our children to be unfaithful, then they will have to suffer the consequences of unfaithfulness. Suffering for your unfaithfulness until the last of your bodies lies in the desert. For 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will surely do these things to this whole wicked community which has banded together against me. They will meet their end in this desert. Here they will die. God can do anything he wants to do and however he wants to do it. Now, some people are offended by God's wrath in the Old Testament. God's wrath is the same in the Old Testament and New Testament. What's the difference? In the New Testament, God's wrath was put on Jesus Christ. And so all the wrath that we see in the Old Testament, Jesus took in our place in the New Testament. And that is the beauty of the gospel of grace. Verse 36, so the men Moses had sent to explore the land who returned and made the whole community grumble against him by spreading a bad report about it. These men responsible for spreading the bad report about the land were struck down and died of a plague before the Lord. Of the men who went to explore the land, only Joshua and Caleb survived. We'll stop there, but it goes on to say the people then started going up after God said, turn back. We have a window of time to do things God's way. They decided to do it their way. And they didn't make it. See, we have to be careful that we follow God's word for what it is, it is God's word to us to lead us through this wilderness, wilderness of life into his life, which starts right now. It continues forever in heaven, but it starts right now. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have already entered into eternity. You, you just haven't realized it all yet as I haven't. So what are the takeaways here? Well, it says that Caleb had a different spirit, verse 24, because he had a different spirit. What was it that was different about Caleb? Well, they served God wholeheartedly, first of all. There can be no half-hearted commitment when it comes to following Jesus. It, we're, scripture tells us, and Jesus even said, love God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. All of it, not half of it, but all of it, wholeheartedly. And Caleb had that spirit. It was a different spirit. And because of that, he believed the promise of God. He believed it. Remember that first verse in chapter 13? Send people to the land that I am giving. 
And that's the promise that uh, Abraham received from God back in Genesis 12. So he believed. So how did his belief in God's promises affect his life? I want to just point out four things quickly. Boldness. Caleb had a boldness in the face of all of the majority of people. He stood alone with Joshua. So believing the promises of God gives you a boldness. Be careful that you don't go with the majority necessarily or that you don't go with the minority necessarily because that's not the point. Go with what God's word says. That's the point. Go with what God says. And if the majority is in that, go with the majority. If the minority is in that, go with the minority. But the main point is stick and stand on God's promises, on God's word. And if you believe God's promises, you will have a boldness to make that stand. Second thing is courage. Verse 30 shows us that courage. Because of his belief in God, he was convinced that God was with them and could face whatever challenges they would face. Now, you and I face challenges in this world, in this life. Those sicknesses and illnesses and death. We face challenges. But do you have the courage to face those challenges because you believe God's word? That he is with you through whatever you face. You'll have a boldness. You'll have a courage. But then, thirdly, you will have a perseverance. You'll have patience beyond understanding. To persevere through everything this life gives you. The fulfillment of God's promises is sometimes immediate, but not always. But always, it is ultimate. Now, turn over, if you will, to Joshua chapter 14. Joshua 14, verse 6. Now the men of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal. This is when Joshua had taken leadership from Moses. And uh, they were finally about to enter. And Caleb uh, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, at Kadesh Barnea about you and me. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked will be your, your inheritance and that of your children forever. Why? Because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since, since the time he said this to Moses. So here I am today, listen, 85 years old. He was 40 when he went up. And so here he is, 45 years later, receiving what was promised him. He's 85 years old. And I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I am just as vigorous to go out into battle now as I was then. That's an amazing thing. I don't want to go into battle at 65. Here's uh, Caleb ready to go. So he had to wait. He had a perseverance. And that's what happens when you stand on the word of God. When you stand on the promises of God, you have that boldness, you have that courage, you have that patience to persevere, perseverance. And why is all of that? The, the fourth thing is hope. It's because you have hope. God has says, I'm going to do this thing. And that then is your hope. See, hope always looks forward. You don't need hope for back here. Hope always faces and looks forward. But most of these people wanted to go back. 
No. We move forward. So if you stand in belief on God's promises, not on the belief of people, but on God's promises, you will find yourself having boldness, courage, perseverance, and a growing hope. Now Moses interceded for the people, and Moses was a foreshadowing of a greater intercessor, Jesus, who intercedes for us, Jesus. So do you believe the promises of Jesus, who said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. That's a promise. I will come to you. And he said, everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise them up at the last day. You're going to be raised up at the last day. Do you believe that? That if you do, you can face whatever this life throws at you. Jesus said, whoever loses their life for me will find it. Are you looking for something this world can't give you? Then look to Jesus. Lose your life and find it by finding him. Jesus said, I will come back and take you to be with me that you may be where I am. No one will take away your joy. He wants us to be where he is. Do you believe that? Jesus said, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. See, belief in Jesus affects your daily living. It should. It affects your daily life. And the degree to which you believe him is the degree to which you and the people around you will see boldness, will see courage, will see perseverance, and will see hope. Are you a person of hope? If you are a believer in Jesus, you ought to be. Because there's nothing in this world that lasts. So why put your hope in something that is dying? Put your hope in that which lives forever. Jesus. So where are you? Where are you in this life of faith? You can know today by standing on the promises of God that came to us through Jesus. Let's pray. Judy is going to begin playing this simple hymn, Spirit of the Living God. And, and as she's playing, I pray that God's Spirit would speak to you. Clearer than He has. So that you know where you stand with Him. And please don't try to stand in your own goodness because you can't. Maybe you're here and you've never made a commitment of faith in Jesus. I encourage you to do that today. You can take this guest and response information you can just fill it out it says I want to trust Jesus for my salvation or I want to speak to someone to know more about it you can do that I would like to become a member of this church you can use this form to fill that out you can come see me afterwards you can see one of our staff you can see our deacons how you respond to God's word is of eternal significance to you for sure but it also affects your practical daily living 
So, Father, I pray that you would speak to us in a way that uh, we can't miss. And, Lord, would you lead us to those lives of wholehearted devotion to you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? Let's sing that. spirit be in you and be seen in you as you go out and you live your life so that people see hope in the life that you live and we do it for his glory father help us to do it help us to live lives that point to jesus as our source of hope and we pray that we would honor you as we do that in jesus name amen God bless you.